Oh, uh, thank you, Tony, and um, thank you, Saab. Um, we've had a great relationship with Jared Ogden and the Saab team, and I think we've both benefited from that engagement, and hopefully that will continue. Uh, welcome, everybody. I know we've got competition tonight from the state of origin, so thank you for uh, hitting record on the, on the record button there so you can watch it afterwards. <laughs> Um, so first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, my Aspie colleagues, in particular Michael Shoebridge, my good friend and good colleague, for his um, mentorship and, and uh, insightful suggestions. And you know, you will see his his influence in the cost of defence as well. Um, I'd also like to thank our research intern, Reese DeWild. Reese, where are you? Put up your. Oh, there he is. Okay. <coughs> who uh, assisted in analysing data and did a lot of the graphics in there. And of course, as always, our awesome events team and our publications team, thank you very much. And I'd just like to assure General Burr and the five other generals here tonight that uh, any resemblance in our cover cartoon to any general serving or retired is purely coincidental. And it's, I know it's definitely not you, Natasha. Kind of looks like Chris Diebel a bit, but you know, he's, a, he's an air marshal, so, okay. All right, let's get to it. Okay, so uh, how much money is in the defence budget? Well, this year the budget continues to follow the trajectory set out in the 2016 white paper of solid real annual increases. The consolidated defence budget, that is the Department of Defence and the Australian Signals Directorate, Directorate reaches $38.7 billion in 2019-20 which, as our cover cartoon notes, is now over $100 million a day. Real growth is 1.3%, which is actually the smallest annual increase under the coalition government. And the budget has actually uh, decreased very slightly as a percentage of GDP from 1.94 to 1.93% because GDP has grown faster than the defence budget. Uh, but those figures are a little misleading because uh, late in the previous financial year, $620 million was moved forward into 2018-19 from 2019-20. So 2018-19 got a bit bigger than expected, 2019-20 was a little smaller than expected. If that uh, last minute adjustment hadn't occurred, real growth would have been a very solid 4.6% and the budget would have been 1.96% uh, of GDP. But ultimately, it makes no real difference to defence uh, which year it gets the money in. It's got it and it's already spent it, I assume, Rebecca. <laughs> so, I heard it at estimates. The CFO said, that it said exactly what it was spent on. So. Okay, and in the interest of full disclosure, I should note that um, while the 2018-19 defence budget started the year looking like it would be a little under $100 million a day, the adjustments that occurred over the course of the financial year actually meant it did end up passing $100 million. So technically, 1920 is not the first year to hit that milestone. Okay, so... Um, to me, one of the big stories is that, that so far the government has delivered on its white paper funding commitments. So the defence white paper presented a 10-year fixed funding line that would not vary as GDP fluctuated up and down. We're now five, uh, four budget years into that decade. And once we take all variations into account, such as adjustments due to uh, foreign exchange rates and supplementation for operations, the $143 billion that Defence has received over those four years is uh, within 1% of the white paper funding line. So, it's, you know, government has delivered. Now, you could argue that Defence has had to fit more into that envelope. So, for example, it doesn't seem to have received additional uh, funding to cover it, the defence contribution to the Pacific Step Up announced by government last year. And so that will include things such as development of the Manus Island Naval Base, acquisition of a large ship for humanitarian assistance and provision of training to regional security forces. So defence will probably have to fund that out of hide. But overall, the big picture is, is defence has received the money government promised. And that's kind of rare in the history of defence funding. Now, as we move through time into the 
uh, future. The big question that people seem most interested in is, will it reach 2% by 2021, as the government promised in the White Paper? The short answer to that is yes, according to the Defence uh, Portfolio Budget Statements. In 2021, it'll pretty much hit exactly. That will require an, an increase of around $3 billion on 2019-20's $38.7 billion. Sounds like a lot, but it's not particularly extraordinary or unachievable uh, by the standards of recent history. But the, the longer answer is actually defence planning has already passed that milestone. Okay, the government never said that the defence budget would be mechanically set at 2% ad infinitum. And in fact, in, according to the budget papers, defence's funding continues to grow be, beyond 2% over the forward estimate. So the, the green line there is a 2% of GDP line. And the purple line is in this area here is what's in the PBS, so the forward estimates in the PBS. And out here, it's the remainder of the 10 years of funding from the defence white paper. And you can see that uh, defence funding actually gets a long way past 2% of GDP. So by the end of the forward estimates, we're about 2.2% of GDP, and it stays around there uh, following. Now, so the 2% a line, a, a hypothetical 2% line, and defence's um, white paper and PBS funding line increasingly diverge after 2021. And while a difference of 2% of GDP may, may not sound like much, in dollar terms, uh, that gap quickly reaches $5 billion a year. Okay, And over the remainder of the white paper decade, it's nearly $22.5 billion. And that difference will be better, bigger, sorry, if the economy doesn't grow at the rate forecast in the uh, budget papers. So our 2% line we've modelled using the 3% growth forecast in the budget papers. Well, 3% growth is pretty racy. Um, uh, since the global financial crisis, we've sort of averaged between 25 and about 2.6%. And, you know, I'm not the only one who's been getting the messaging from the Reserve Bank that the economy's not looking totally flash. And there were you know, uh, some statistics out today saying growth over the last 12 months has been less than 2%. So that gap may actually get even bigger than that. Now we know uh, Defence's investment planning extends well into the future, so we can be pretty sure that Defence is spend, planning on spending all of the money that government has promised it. And if, and if you weren't, Christopher Pine would have been saying, don't you trust me? You know, so, so I think we're pretty sure that Defence's uh, plan is using all that money. Well, what that means is if this or a future government should decide that something closer to 2% is what it's willing to pay, there will be um, an impact on capability and also on defence industry. So it's probably useful, would be useful for the, the government to confirm that it is still committed to the white paper funding model. Okay, so next big question is where is the money going? Well, much of the increased funding is planned to flow into capital acquisitions. So traditionally, we can say there's three big buckets in uh, organisations. There's capital, it's to buy new stuff, personnel to crew it, and operating to actually do stuff with it. Uh, we're about here. And over the course of the forward estimates, that the capital share of the budget grows to about 39%. Okay, just as some um, uh, context, uh, if we go back to the year 2000, the capital budget's averaged about 28%. Okay. And according to the white paper model, beyond the Ford estimates, it stays at about you know, 39. So we're in that quite a 39, 40%, which is a big chunk of the budget. Okay. Um, and so that will deliver a massive increase and so the capital budget alone will reach um, 19 billion by the end of the Ford estimates and nearly 23 billion by the end of the decade. And so since 13-14 uh, when the coalition came to power, that's real growth, so not just nominal growth, but real growth taking inflation into account of 150% by the end of the Ford estimates and 185% by the end of the white paper. 
So uh, you would say that you know the defence capital budget is in the land of milk and honey. So if we, that's where we started under the coalition. That's where we've gotten to. That's about by the end of the forward estimates, and that's by the end of the white paper. And so orange line is um, real growth. So taking inflation into account. So it is, it is a, a massive increase. So you would think that, that that should be enough to cover the ambitious acquisition plan contained in the 2016 white paper. Well, will it be? Well, you know, that's why you have Aspie to come along and rain on everybody's parade by saying, yeah, but, yeah, but. So here's a, a few yeah, buts to consider. So the first, of course, is that the cost of military equipment is rising much faster than inflation. Okay, I talked about that in a bit more detail in uh, last year's cost of defence, so I'm not going to repeat all of that discussion here, but just as one example, in real current day dollar terms, each future submarine will be roughly three times the cost of a, current, of a Collins submarine, as an example. Okay, secondly, there are some heroic annual leaps built into the capital budget in the forward estimates. So, for example, of 19% uh, in, um, in 2021, followed by 15.5% uh, in 2122. I mean, that's a massive uh, real increase. But we know it can be very hard to ramp up spending that quickly. Anybody who's worked in this space knows it can be very hard to spend money. And thirdly, there is the issue of rising operating costs. I mentioned last year that Navy is doubling in tonnage, which will inevitably uh, drive up operating costs. So this year we'll leave Navy alone and pick on Air Force. So. Okay, so if we look at the big um, air combat transition, which um, Air Force has been going through, is we move from a, a combined classic Hornet fleet and we've combined with F-111, F-111's leaving, Growler coming into service, uh, oh, sorry, the Super Hornet coming into service, Growler coming into service, and now um, F-35A coming into service. That's, that's the hours flowing by the fleet. Okay, so we can see that there's, there is some overall increase in flying hours, but it is not orders of magnitude difference. So there was a spike here, that's the campaign against ISIS, okay, so the normal trajectory would be about there. We're here and we're sort of entering after, you know, many, many years, dating back to 2002 when government first chose JSF as the preferred solution. We're now, you know, in that final push to um, get the three squadrons into service by the end of 22-23. Okay, and that's an increase of, of about sixfold on where we got to last year. Okay, so that's where we're at in terms of hours. But as with every other platform, the increase in capability delivered by the new air combat fleet will come at significantly greater cost. So we got some data this first time um, this year. We got some numbers around the cost of JSF. And by simple arithmetic, dividing the number of hours flown by the cost, sustainment cost of the fleet, it's about $42,000 an hour for JSF. And that's about twice the cost of the classic Hornet. Okay, and but oddly, it's about half the cost of uh, Super Hornet Growler. And to me, that's a staggering uh, number. The, the fleet as a whole is $511 million. So, uh, again, this is this we have one data point here, so you know, don't get too carried away. That will change. Hopefully, it will change downwards. But as I was just saying to Mel Huffield, there's not a lot of numbers that trend downwards in this space, they all kind of trend upwards. So, okay, so. So basically, Reese and I uh, took these numbers. We basically, so the, the, the PBS doesn't project the cost numbers forward, but it does project the flying hours forward. So we multiplied future year's flying hours by this year's cost per hour. And you come up with something like that. So your standard defense cost curve of going dramatically upwards. So we've gone from, these are nominal dollars, so these do not take in inflation into account, so they're slightly distorting, but back here, in the dying days of the classic Hornet F-111, it's $260 million a year. Out here, we're up to about um, over $1.1 billion 
a year. Okay, so it's a little unsophisticated approach, but you know, it's, it's all the data I got, so. But it's not just um, the operating cost of platforms that's rising. As defence becomes increasingly network centric, the cost of the ICT backbone, that is absolutely vital to hold everything together, is going up steeply. So again, this, this is taken from the historical PBSs and annual reports. It's um, Chief Information Officer Group's supplier's budget. So it's not capital acquisition, it's the paying the Telstra bill, paying for bandwidth, you know, paying for computer software upgrades and things like that. Just keeping the whole enterprise moving. So again, uh, up from uh, $450 million uh, in 2008-9 to $1.6 billion at the end of the forward estimates. So in that period, it's grown by 100, nearly 150% in real terms. And I can assure you that overall defence budget has not come anywhere near that. It's a number closer to about 36%. Okay. So that back cost of operating the backbone that holds everything together is going up much faster than defence funding is. And, I, and as defence uh, moves increasingly towards being an organisation ba based on collecting big data, moving big data around, processing it, redistributing it, it's difficult to kind of see that suddenly, you know, reversing at all or even slowing down. So it's not surprising that operating costs are increasing faster than predicted in the white paper. Since the white paper, operating costs have been about $4 billion more than planned, and meanwhile, capital expenditure has underachieved by a very similar number. Is there a direct correlation? Well, I, I suspect there is some kind of correlation there. And ironically, another potential cause for concern is that some costs, such as personnel spending, are not rising much at all but perhaps they should be. So uh, personnel is traditionally the biggest of the three buckets, but it's gonna fall below 30% of the total. So it's on track to become the smallest of the lot. <clears throat> and that's because the white paper only allocated the ADF an additional 4,400 personnel. So it's only an 8% increase. So it's to me a little hard to see how defence can acquire all of that capital equipment and develop new capabilities such as cyber with only that small increase. And we should also, also note that um, unfortunately defence is having trouble meeting the relatively modest white paper targets. It's only managed to grow the ADF by about 600 since the white paper, which is about uh, 1,100 short of the target. So if uh, increasing capital spending is hard, increasing ADF numbers is uh, even harder. And it looks like that that is starting to hurt. We know from a recent ANAO report that uh, the Anzac class frigate HMAS Perth is gonna be up on blocks for two years after its latest upgrade because um, defense couldn't essentially find a crew for it. So that's two years uh, out of service. And so it may be that defence could end up with a force fitted for, but not with people. <laughs> Sorry, that's Michael's joke. I gotta give Michael a credit. You know. Thank you. Um, so in short, there may well be structural factors that mean sustaining capital spending at nearly 30, sorry, nearly 40% of the total budget may just not be achievable. As I said, the average since the start of the century has been uh, 28%. And interestingly, um, Defence's capital budget has stuck fairly stubbornly around 30% for the last five years. So that's where we are. You know, we look at the, first, the last five years and sort of hovered, you know, one or two percent either side of 30. So there does seem to be sort of some kind of structural impediment to kind of get beyond that. Okay, so that was As ASPE's mandatory glass half full analysis. The other side of the story is that the substantial investment the government is making is delivering greatly um, enhanced capability across all of Defence's capability streams. Underneath the headline stories about heavy investment in locally assembled protected and armoured vehicles. Sorry, I've got to get my mandatory Land 400 jibe in there, but, you know, sorry. You know, but underneath those headline stories, the digitisation of Army is uh, continuing, which uh, chiefs of Army have uh, repeatedly said is its, its highest priority, so that is continuing, as well as uh, enhancements to soldier systems. 
The delivery of key air capabilities such as P-8 uh, maritime patrol aircraft and training aircraft is nearing completion. And defence is in something uh, of a golden age of infrastructure investment, no doubt aided by Minister Pine pitching in and doing his bit to move some dirt around. And so this year, uh, a construction company, Lendlease, tops the Australian Defence Magazine's top 40 defence suppliers list. Uh, also, and the upgrades necessary to keep the Anzac-class frigates and Collins-class submarines, a relevant capability for many years during the long transition to the future fleet, are being delivered. If only we could get the frigates back in the water. But. OK, and that brings us to the jewel in the crown of the government's capital investment program, the Naval Shipbuilding Plan, which is also central to its defence industry policy. And so uh, in this year's cost of defence, we provide an update on progress in the Naval Shipbuilding Plan. And in many regards, the Naval Shipbuilding Plan has made great progress. So the Arafura class um, offshore patrol vessel has started construction on schedule and it was a very, very racy schedule. And so defence and industry have done extremely well uh, to do that. Also in the past year, uh, BAE's Type 26 uh, frigate has been selected as the design for the Hunter class future frigate. And importantly, the revised commercial strategy under which ASC shipbuilding became a subsidiary of BAE has been implemented. And also a head contract for the frigate program was signed in an astonishingly short uh, period of time. Uh, in contrast, the future submarine program delivering the attack class submarines took nearly three years to sign its head contract, the strategic partnering agreement. But it's done now. And almost immediately afterwards, Defence and Naval Group signed the design contract. And, and to be fair, uh, Defence has consistently stated that the long negotiations over the strategic partnering agreement have not affected schedule. Uh, progress is also occurring in the underpinning programmatic elements of the shipbuilding enterprise. So the development of the Osborne North Shipyard should be completed in time to start prototyping of frigate blocks in 2020. And work has commenced also on the submarine yard, though mainly in the design space so far. It's also likely that the worst of the so-called valley of death in shipbuilding workforce is behind us, so now it's time to ramp up. Development of the necessary shipbuilding workforce was always one of the greatest risks to the shipbuilding plan, and that hasn't changed. There are several measures underway to address this risk, such as the start of the Naval Shipbuilding College and the release of the Naval uh, Shipbuilding Strategic Workforce Discussion paper. And also the government has invested in money in, as workers come off the uh, Air Warfare Destroyer project, they transition to other uh, shipbuilding projects. Uh, but you do suspect there will be some lag in establishing that workforce and that could have some impact on schedule. But it's important to keep some perspective on shipbuilding workforce. While the numbers of skilled workers required may sound large and the numbers sort of flo floating around are sort of around 5,000 in the shipyards themselves directly working on ships, that's small um, compared to Adelaide's workforce and it's certainly very small compared to Australia's workforce. So that means, uh, to me, the challenge is not insoluble. But it also means that the supply of shipbuilding workforce will always be exposed to changing demands for workers in the broader economy. OK, again, that's the glass half full. Glass half empty is there are still some challenges. As the schedule for the future frigates and submarines becomes clearer, we can see that we won't get the first frigates into service, first frigate into service until around 2030, and the first submarine won't be in service until around 2034 or 2035, despite a conservative design philosophy based on only using currently mature technologies. Even if they deliver the intended capability, that's a long time to wait. And if we have to wait until the second batch of future submarines for new technologies, that could get us into the 2040s. OK, and the dollars, sort of more pictures going up towards the right. So last year we predicted, um, and I, I've still got the beer coaster that I did the, the calculations on, we predicted that the annual cash flow for the shipbuilding plan would reach three and a half to four billion dollars a year. I'd argue that's looking increasingly certain. So this year um, it's hit two billion dollars. OK, and we are still three to four years away 
from starting construction on the future submarine and three years away from starting construction on the, the future frigate. Uh, we also predicted that Defence uh, will have spent over $20 billion between the frigate and submarine program before the, the first of each one of them um, becomes operational. Again, I, I'd suggest that that's conservative as well. So we now know that so far the government has approved uh, over $6 billion for the future submarine and over $6 billion for the future frigate. And my understanding is, is that does not include acquisition of any vessels. So that completes the design process and uh, acquires some long lead items, so motors and things, things that will actually go on to those vessels, but it's not, it won't actually get you any complete vessels. So I think uh, $20 billion is uh, conservative. Okay, uh, so meanwhile, uh, as, we, uh, as I argue in the chapter one of the cost of defence, Australia's strategic circumstances are worsening as China's power grows, along with its willingness to use that power outside of the rules-based global order. Simultaneously, US military power is increasingly stretched, and if you look at the state of the US budget, that's not going to be turned around any time soon through greater defence spending. Now, it's clear that the government is aware of this situation, and its Pacific step-up strategy is, you know, the start of a policy that is, you know, starting to address these things. However, so far, the government has not signalled any substantial changes either to the military strategy of the White Paper or its force structure. I'd argue it's likely we'll need to be more self-reliant, at least in some areas of military capability, and that probably can't wait until the 2030s. Moreover, the ships being delivered by the Naval Shipbuilding Plan will enter an operating environment characterised by proliferating threats, such as cheap anti-ship cruise missiles, hypersonic weapons, and a much more congested undersea domain. With modern warships being designed to defeat a range of threats to protect their precious human cargo, this has meant that they have become exquisitely expensive, so much so that they can only be acquired in small quantities. Now, Australia is about the only country bucking the trend in Western countries of declining numbers of ships. The US Navy is declining. Royal Navy is a shadow of its former self. We're only doing it because of that massive investment that I've spoken about. And that's because ships are just so expensive. And also, since they attempt to do all things well, they do uh, many things badly. So, for example, the Air Warfare Destroyer uh, Project has spent nearly $9 billion to get eight anti-ship missiles to sea. So the future frigate will likely be similar in terms of its offensive capability. So the value, value for money calculus doesn't favour billion dollar manned platforms that are too valuable to risk losing to swarms of missiles and unmanned systems costing under a million dollars a piece. Again, I mentioned Land 400 there, so, so I've, I've, I've done it previously, so you know. Okay, but we should not despair. The capability we need in the future can be enabled by another fundamental development reshaping the world, namely the fourth industrial revolution. The key elements of the fourth industrial revolution include autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, cheaper, more accessible space resources, and 3D printing. Now, these technologies uh, certainly have the potential to democratise military technology and increase the threat posed by non-state actors. That's, that's the downside. But the upside is that they will also help militaries, including ours, break out of the vicious cycle of increasingly complex but increasingly expensive manned platforms. So in the cost of defence, um, we argue that we need to hedge in our plans for future capabilities, particularly naval capabilities. And the key element of this hedging strategy is to devote more resources to autonomous systems. Even the United States Navy, the world's largest, has realised that this is the only viable way to deliver greater mass and it is making significant investment in unmanned platforms that will complement manned vessels. So I'm not for a minute actually suggesting we should cancel a future frigate project or future submarine project or even land 400. So there will be a transition which could last decades, and I don't think anybody really knows how long it's going to last, where we will have mixes of, of um, autonomous and manned systems. 
So the, the Australian Defence Force needs to do the same, to compensate for its lack of mass, to get new capabilities sooner, and perhaps most importantly, remove humans from an increasingly lethal battle space. Moreover, many of the technologies being developed for autonomous systems, such as artificial intelligence, can be integrated into our legacy manned platforms that still have to serve for many years to come. And in my view, having spoken extensively with Australian defence industry over the last year, Australian industry and academia are very well placed to contribute to this. And I have no doubt that defence is uh, considering how to do this, but it's, but it's difficult from the outside to see what's going on in defence, but uh, you know, there are many, many smart people in defence, and I'm sure defence is doing it. But it will require investment, and this requires restructuring defence's investment program. Currently, less than 1% of defence's budget goes into its innovation funds. And despite, so despite having much of its cash locked up in shipbuilding and armoured vehicles, Defence needs to find a way to free up cash to invest in emerging technologies. And I think the, this can only come really from drawing on the big dollars in Defence's mega projects. But just as important as money is imagination and a willingness to pursue the disruptive potential of new technologies so they are not dismissed out of hand as poor substitutes for traditional platforms. If we simply regard autonomous systems as a way to do our current business a little better, we miss their potential to transform the business itself. So we need to be exploring new operating concepts involving human machine teaming. And the only way to do this is to get autonomous systems into the field and let our service people unleash their imaginations to see what can really be done with them. And I'd argue that one way to help achieve this uh, would be the establishment of an Australian version of DARPA, the US Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. So that is an, an agency that essentially sits outside defence but has a single-minded focus on disruptive innovation. And that's one of the policy proposals in ASPE's uh, Agenda for Change, our um, incoming government brief, which there are free copies of out there. So. Um, yeah, and so, by the way, that's one reason we don't talk too much about um, the election in this is because we've kind of covered it already in our in our agenda for change. Okay, so to recap, the government has delivered the funding promised in the white paper. If that continues, the defence budget will grow past 2% of GDP to 2.2%. That increase is going largely into capital acquisitions. But you can't just increase capital spending without also increasing operating and personnel spending so you can actually use that equipment. It may well be that either Defence will need to reduce its aspirations for capital equipment to restore the balance between the three buckets, or the government will need to increase Defence funding even further. On top of that dilemma is the question of how to free up cash to develop the emerging technologies that will shape future warfare when so much funding is locked up in the mega projects. And finally, the force outlined in the 2016 white paper is broadly the same as that outlined in the 2009 white paper. And if our understanding of our strategic circumstances has changed since 2016, then it even more certainly has since 2009. And there's no point investing billions in military capability if it doesn't support Australia's political or military strategy. So I think it's time for a new defence white paper so that the government can assure itself that the strategic triumvirate of ends, ways and means are properly aligned to preserve Australia's security. Thank you.